It is my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Sarah DeWitt. Sarah is a visionary, author, and educator, vice president of PBS Kids Interactive at the public broadcasting service, PBS. As vice president of PBS Kids Digital, Sarah oversees day-to-day -day development of PBS's multi-platform content for kids and families. Sarah has led innovative strategies to build connected and immersive educational experiences for kids across media platforms. This includes the Kids Screen and Webby Award-winning PBSKids.org site, which reaches over 13 million unique visitors per month and offers hundreds of games, videos, and activities that I've seen myself because my seven-year-old adores them. Sarah played an integral role in the launch of the PBS Kids video app, offering more free educational video content on mobile than any other children's media brand. The app was named one of the 50 best video apps for parents by Babbel. Before coming to PBS Kids, Sarah worked as a preschool teacher and a management researcher. Please join me in welcoming Sarah DeWitt. Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited um, to be joining this conference. I attended many sessions yesterday and uh, found myself taking lots of notes. So thank you so much for uh, welcoming me so warmly. It's been fun to be here for all the awards. Um, I've been told that you have a long break after this. Um, so I'm going to warn you now, I'm going to go a little bit beyond 9.30 since we're starting a little bit late. So I know some of you need to leave at 9.30 for another workshop. I won't be offended. Um, but uh, I hope that you have a little time to, to st stay. Um, so Celeste, thank you so much for your introduction. Uh, she mentioned a lot about what I do at PBS Kids. Uh, and I, I oversee pbskids.org and our streaming video services. I also oversee the team that does all of the app development. Um, so lots of games, lots of educational content for kids. And I have a New Hampshire connection. My brother is a fifth and sixth grade teacher in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, uh, which is that township north of Colebrook, right before you get to Canada. And I'm um, very inspired by my brother. He has dedicated his educational career to working with kids in very rural areas and brings a lot of creativity to the classroom. This is my first time ever being at the same conference with him. So this is really, really exciting for me. So thank you, Bridger. <laughs> So um, pbskids.org um, and PBS reaches more kids two to five than any other kids network. I just want to give you a few, few of the numbers. I'm sure many of you have seen PBS Kids and pbskids.org before, I hope. Seeing a few nods. Okay, great. Um, we also have 40 apps for kids, uh, which have been downloaded almost 20 million times. Uh, we deliver more streams of videos uh, than any other kids network. Uh, we are consistently the, the top source for kids' videos streamed online, which is really exciting, and all of it is free. Um, PBS also manages a site for teachers called PBS Learning Media. Um, all of the things I'm going to talk about today, all the games that I'm going to mention, are on PBS Learning Media. We have over 100,000 free resources for teachers and students on learning media, um, and it's all uh, in, all searchable for teachers to be able to find by grade level and by subject area. And uh, New Hampshire Public Television has their own version of learning media available at this URL. Um, they are in booth 16 today if you want to go over and learn a little bit more about learning media. There are also two more sessions today that will get into PBS resources. These are all free. Uh, Susan Adams has done a great job of bringing a lot of really local New Hampshire content into their knowledge website. So I hope you'll take some time to take a look. So what I'm going to talk about today 
is first of all, kids and their media usage habits. We have seen a lot of the technology trends change over the last few years. So what exactly are kids doing right now? And then what does this mean for teachers? I focus most specifically on game development for education and kids. And so that's where I'm going to spend most of my time today, is talking about um, some of the things that we're seeing in research that we're doing with digital games with kids. Uh, and then a little bit about games and social emotional uh, skills and ways that we can develop those skills through gameplay. And I promise I will share a list of resources at the end where you can find all of this content and all of this research. Um, and uh, I, can, I can share that with, with folks after the conference as well. So the work that I primarily work on with PBS Kids is focused on uh, informal learning environments. We're thinking about kids at home, we're thinking about kids and parents, and we do a lot of work with after school centers and pre, um, preschool, kind of informal preschool centers. That said, everything we do is based on educational goals, and learning media does a great job of helping present it all for classrooms. But most of what I'm gonna talk about is research that we've done in more informal environments. So first up, Kids and media habits. I know that all of you are very aware that kids have more and more access to technology at younger and younger ages. We all are seeing kids in restaurants playing with tablets. Um, people are always amazed at how much their babies can play with an iPad. We're seeing it in a lot of different places. It feels really ubiquitous. That said, there's a lot of fear about this. The keynote yesterday mentioned this, that um, technology really tends to bring out a panic in a lot of people. And so lots of articles like this have been out saying that we shouldn't have any technology for kids under 12, definitely not for preschoolers. Um, and it's, it gets to be a kind of controversial issue. I wanted to share with you some of the actual numbers. CommonSenseMedia.org um, has one of the few places that I know that's done a very comprehensive study of how kids are using technology outside of the classroom. So in home use, 75% of kids right now have access to a smart mobile device at home, and 40% of families, kids zero to eight, own some kind of tablet. Um, kids are only spending 15 minutes a day, between the ages of zero and eight, on mobile or tablet screens. Um, but it's an hour and 55 minutes total all screen time for kids zero to eight. Really, the number one source of screen time still for kids is television. That is what they are watching the most. Um, more than any of this other kind of new technology for these younger kids. The digital divide is something that matters a lot to PBS. We think a lot about accessibility and making sure that we are reaching as many kids as possible. So we have seen that digital divide lessen quite a bit, but it's still there. 65% um, um, of lower income families have access to mobile media, but if you begin to look down these numbers, you can see that higher income kids are much more likely to use this technology for educational content than low income kids. This is something that we think is a real problem. Um, as kids get more and more access to devices, it feels like there's not anyone really explaining how to use this and what the educational possibilities are for these new technology experiences. So recently, um, two major organizations have revised their technology um, recommendations for young children. The National Association for the Education of Young Children partnered with the Fred Rogers Center to update their guidelines. And what they have said, and I, I put the two things here that I thought were most interesting, technology and interactive media are here to stay. Uh, and therefore, we need to be thinking about what, what their place is in the lives of young children. Um, but still, there are concerns about whether this is good for young children. There are no studies out there right now about how screen time really affects very young children. Um, so we need to be thinking about the context in which kids are interacting with content. Um, just a few months ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics, for the first time, lifted their ban on screen time for kids under the age of two. And their reasoning is, it's another environment. Kids are going to see screens, we can't avoid it. Um, but we need to be thinking about the positive and negative effects, and we need to be thinking about how we introduce this content to kids. Both organizations had taken a no technology policy for a very long time because they didn't want any kind of human interactions with kids to diminish. They wanted to make sure that parents and teachers were talking with kids and interacting with them as much as possible. And so both organizations are really thinking about how does 
technology get mediated with these kids? How are we talking to them about it? So one of my heroes is Fred Rogers. And I don't know if many of you know this story, but Fred Rogers um, actually was planning to go to seminary right out of college. And it was that summer that he went home to be with his family right before he started seminary, and he saw television for the first time. And as you can see in this quote, his reaction to television was um, people, people who, who knew that he had seen it, he said, I hate it. They're, they're quote, you can find this on YouTube of him saying, what I saw on television I thought was terrible, but I knew I needed to now put my hand in it. He saw the potential for this giant megaphone that was going to be going into every home for educational purposes, for a way to really connect with young children and families. And he realized that really what mattered was the content. What matters is what we're putting on those screens and how we're introducing them to children, how we're talking to them. So what does this mean for teachers? Um, I know that all of you all are in a really interesting situation because not only do you have the pressure to kind of integrate technology into your lesson plans, into how you're teaching in good and effective ways. You don't want to just use technology for technology's sake. You want to be really using it as the technology is giving you new opportunities. It also means that you are playing a role of modeling good technology use for your students. What are the right ways to use it? What are the right contexts in which to use it? What's a good educational use of technology? And what's a less pro-social use of technology? Um, for those low-income kids, it also may mean that you are introducing them to technology. They may have never even experienced this. This is something that my brother helps me with all the time. Pittsburgh, New Hampshire doesn't have any cell phone towers. So most people there don't have cell phones. Internet access really only became um, affordable just a few years ago, and it definitely is not in most children's homes there. So there are still pockets in the US where kids are only interacting with any technology when they come to school. And so this puts a huge burden on teachers to try to introduce that content to them. Another thing is that there's a lot of content out there that says it's educational. I just took a few screen grabs from the app stores. Um, and these are kind of when you put in the category education. I can tell you as a content creator, there is not a vetting process for getting into the education category in Google Play or in iTunes. You just say, I want this to go in the education category. Uh, that puts a lot of pressure on you as teachers to figure out what is truly educational and what is rigorous and what is going to be useful. Um, so there's just a lot, a lot of noise out there and a lot of decisions to be made. So with that, can children learn important skills from games? I believe that they can, and I want to share a little bit of research with you. But then I want to dig into the kinds of games that teach different kinds of things. So um, at PBS Kids, we map all of our content to the skills that we know are being introduced in preschool classrooms. Uh, we work with a lot of advisors to create curriculum frameworks to help map our content to it. And we also use this for um, our game development as well. Um, Across all of our content, we are thinking about social emotional important skills, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, um, and creativity. So we're kind of looking at the whole picture here. The research that I want to share with you today is specifically focused on math educational content. Um, we have a grant from the US Department of Education called Ready to Learn. It's specifically focused on children who come from Title I schools environments. It's preschool and it's helping kids get ready to learn by the time they enter kindergarten. Um, and the last five years, that grant has been focused on math. And so we've been thinking about math development content. And the research we've been doing has been on both videos and games. Um, the first study um, was over 10 weeks in, class, in a classroom environment. So this actually was a formal randomized control trial. Um, not only were we using games and videos with these kids, um, the games were often on interactive whiteboards, the teachers were also given a teacher's guide. So they were given some introductions to how to bring this content into the classroom. So the main group we were looking at is the kids who had the teacher guide and this video, the video and games uh, integrated into their classrooms. Then there was a control group who wasn't doing anything, and there was also a group who just had the technology without the teacher's guide. 
And what we saw was the children who were in that group that had the teacher-mediated piece showed statistically significant gains in the math skills. They really had a good bump in what they were doing. A really nice side benefit of this was the preschool teachers we were talking to actually showed much greater um, subject matter knowledge after experiencing this. Um, math is a tricky subject for preschool teachers. They're nervous about it. Parents are nervous about it too. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we saw that when teachers went through this experience, they actually felt much more comfortable with the material. Um, a second study that happened in a home environment, very similar with math content, um, was over eight weeks with nine preschools, but it was asking the parents to mediate some of the experience. So the parents were sent home with a little parent booklet, and they were supposed to do an activity with their kids and play a game with their kids. Um, the parents were not given any training. They were just told, here are the things that we would like you to play with your child. And once again, we saw statistically significant gains in the child's math knowledge. Um, it felt like the parents became more motivated to set aside some time to work and teach with their kids, um, to talk to them about these lessons. And then parents recognized that this increased use of games and playfulness fostered a, a learning environment in their homes. It was a real eye-opening opportunity for these parents, and something we took from this was this realization that any time could be learning time. This was really exciting for parents. We have lots and lots of studies. They're all at pbskids.org slash lab, and you can see actually what was tested, what games were there. Um, you, can, you can also watch the videos that were in these studies. So all of this is here. But I want to point out two of the key findings from this. Number one, that mediation really matters. In both of these studies, when the parent or the teacher um, were involved in the conversations about this online content, the gains were much greater. I mentioned that, that group where the kids had just the technology but not the teacher's guide. Um, those kids made some gains. Just playing with the games actually helped their math knowledge. But having that interaction with the teacher made all the difference. And that interaction was really the game was part of a lesson that also included some other activities. Um, this was critical to greater learning gains. So we've partnered with Boston University School of Education to do some teaching tips for integrating educational media into preschool classrooms. Um, they're all available on pbskids.org slash lab. Um, some of them are lesson plans. Uh, that actually take games and video and put them together, and others um, are some videos that actually walking through how to integrate a game into a lesson. Um, one of my favorite things that, that um, these videos talk about is when you start to preview the game, you realize this might be going too fast for you to be able to take turns easily. So you want to bring three kids up to the whiteboard at the same time. Or if you're going to do this on an iPad, what are the best points to then give the iPad to the next child. So it's really looking at very practical matters of integrating technology, as well as just some good strategies for doing so. Another key finding is that games can make the content accessible. Uh, leading up to all of this math research, we did a survey of parents and asked them about their understanding of math concepts. And you won't be surprised to hear that parents across the board kind of had really high math phobia. They were like, no, that's something kids learn in school. I'm not qualified to teach my kid math. Math is really hard. I mean, we all don't we just hate that people keep saying math is hard to young kids? Um, so we realized that when parents experience this, when they watch their kids playing the games and when they watch these videos, it clicked for the parents too. They suddenly realized the math, I get this. I know what these math concepts are and I see the practicality. Um, and so it was a great leveler. It actually brought parents into the experience um, much more readily. So the games can make that content really accessible. So when you're choosing games to bring into a classroom experience, we realized as we started to do some research on which games helped to really move the needle, that different kinds of game mechanics and different types of games actually were critical at different points in the learning process. And specifically, some games were best for introducing a game to a child, introducing a concept, excuse me, to a child. Some games were better for helping the child practice some of those skills. And then other games are best for the actual assessment of skills. And what I want to do is walk you through some of these game examples 
because there are some really specific things you can look for in a game that will help guide whether or not the game is best for which point in the learning process. Um, I'm going to use Curious George uh, as examples for these games. Um, the Curious George Busy Day suite of gameplay is all focused on really early numeracy and counting, so it's going to be easier for me to kind of point things out. All of this is available for free on pbskids.org. So an exposure game, a good example of an exposure game is this Curious George Bubble Pop game. Um, and I'm not going to pull these games up live, so I have some screenshots just to walk you through. This is an exposure game for ki exposing kids to early numeracy and counting for kids two, three, and four years old. And this game actually uses the microphone on your computer. So as you are, as the child is playing the game, a bubble rises out of the bathtub, and you can clap your hands, or you can yell pop, and the bubble will pop and count up with the numbers. And there are some important things that happen here just introducing the skill. It's a very, very simple game, obviously, but very fun for kids to sit there and clap their hands and yell pop. They love being in control of what's happening on the screen. The, the information is modeled in multiple ways. You see the bubbles come up, and you're counting them, one, two, three. You also get the number on the screen, and the man in the yellow hat says the number. So the child is being exposed in three different ways. They're counting the bubbles as they come up, they're seeing the number represented on the screen, and they're hearing the number. They also are in control of when the counting happens. So they are helping pop the bubbles along. So good exposure games, good things that are introducing a child to the concept are doing things like this. There are no need, there's no need for choices that are correct or incorrect. It's not like they can get something wrong counting by clapping their hands. Um, it really is about introducing them to the concept using a gameplay mechanic that's really engaging and fun so that kids will want to be doing this. And the skills need to be really clearly presented. The next kind of game, oh, th sorry, another example, um, this one uses a camera. And in this one, uh, monkey jump, you have to jump. And that makes George jump, and he pops the ball into this. The difference with, with bubble pop is that then the numbers don't go away. You get to see the numbers building on themselves. So you get the one, the two, the three. Every time you jump, you get another one. You again are hearing it. You're seeing it. And now you have the physical representation of the number of balls. Another really great exposure game to help kids see a concept and begin to play with it on their own. So the next then concept would be how do kids begin to practice a skill um, through gameplay. Now, this kind of game is probably the most common that you will see out there. And that is a gameplay that has what we call in the game development world a twitch mechanic, something that is just kind of a quick gameplay. You're trying to scoop things up. You're trying to hit things. You're trying to do things. But at the same time, you're continuing to be exposed to some concept. So in the case of this practice game, George is holding a net, and all of these bugs appear. And the man in the yellow hat says, do you think that there are more blue bugs or more yellow bugs? And so the child has to decide right there, has to do a quick estimation on the screen. Are there more yellow or are there more blue? And then they choose yellow or blue on the screen. And then the Twitch game piece begins, and you use the net to catch all of the bugs. You're just quickly picking them up. For young children, this is very fun. You don't have to be specific. You know, you just are sw swiping your net all around. And then the man in the yellow hat helps you count the bugs in each category, so you can see whether or not your guess was right. So as a practice for skills, the kid is having to make some sort of skill-based guess, but they still get to play. And it doesn't matter how they play. Again, they're not, they're not um, penalized for making a wrong answer. If they, if they choose the wrong thing right at the beginning, they still get to play and catch all of those. But then the man, man in the yellow hat is going to talk you through um, the decision you made and whether or not it was right or wrong and give you more opportunities to practice. Uh, and then it gets progressively more complicated. You get more bugs and uh, it becomes harder to estimate. So in a practice game, the things you want to look for, um, the choices can be correct or incorrect, but you need a good feedback play loop. You want to really listen to what those wrong answer prompts are. How, are they, how is the game telling you what was good or bad about the decision you made and maybe give you some nuance to that decision? Um, and then gameplay doesn't stop when you get something wrong. Uh, I'm a game, I'm sorry, I don't have 
time to show you, but I really would love for you to play, is the Cat in the Hat, the Great Shape Race. So you can see Nick and Sally here are running down this uh, pathway. They're scooping up shapes as fast as they can. So it's again, it's a twitch game mechanic. You're just trying to scoop up shapes. As you're scooping them up, the cat is telling you what that shape is and giving you some, some notes about it, like a triangle has three sides. But what you begin to realize is you actually are trying to find the shapes that fit into the cart behind him. So you can scoop up any shapes at all, but you're actually trying, as you get into the game, you're progressively trying to find shapes that actually fit into this model. And then you have a second stage where you then are pulling the shapes out and trying to match them. So a really great practice game. Another um, exploration or um, a, a good practice game are things that are open-ended and are exploration or simulations. And these are things that really have cause and effect. The child does something, there's a clear, um, there's a clear effect based on what they decide, like building a ramp or building a tube. This is the marvelous marble coaster where you're building a, a roller coaster for your marbles. Things can speed up, things can jump, but you have to play around with the mechanic to make it work. Um, Minecraft, in its open-ended form, is a great exploratory kind of practice game when you get into the places where there's truly cause and effect with what you're building. So there are place, places then for kids to kind of play with mechanics. And then finally, assessment games. Now these are the games that are most likely attached to some kind of progress tracker or some kind of learning analytics platform. These are probably the games that are most likely being um, sold in as kind of like full curriculum games for your school um, because they need to be able to give you feedback. What's different about these games and what you want to look for in an assessment game is um, that the, the rules are very clear. This time there are right and wrong answers. Um, kids in this particular game need to be able to count down from three to zero. So Doc, Professor Wiseman here says, we need to count down to launch this rocket. Click on the highest number first. Three, and then you need to click on the two, the one. The, the numbers are stated for the child when they roll over them, but they are not given any hints or any help because this is truly trying to measure how well they understand this concept. So if they get the wrong answer, she just will say, nope, that's not it. And it's not giving them any kind of indicator. That kind of game is really best just for teaching you what the child knows at this point. And these are the kinds of games that are most likely to really frustrate a child if they have not achieved those skills yet. So you want to watch really carefully about how you use games like this uh, in a classroom experience. I know there's a lot, of, um, a lot of people think, oh, I should use an assessment game to kind of assess the skill level before we get into an experience. If the child hasn't even been introduced to the concept yet, this might just be a really frustrating experience. So um, as the child, it, for this particular game, it gets more complicated. The numbers suddenly aren't in order. Um, they appear all over the screen. And so it gets harder. So you can really see how well they have grasped the information. So the best assessment games, must, the answers must be correct or incorrect. Um, and it really should discourage any kind of guess and check. And that's where a kid just is clicking on everything until they get the right answer. An assessment game is measuring that to make sure that they're not just throwing out any answer to try to get through it. Um, it's, not giving, it's not saying you were successful because you made it to the success screen. It really is looking at the, ch the choices the child is making. Another thing that's really uh, interesting to look at is instructions in games. Um, and I know that I have, at, at many points talked to preschool teachers who have said, you know, I, I started to play this game but there were no instructions and I just felt like it was going to take me way too long to explain to the kids what to do. <clears throat> and there's actually a lot of research out there about instructions and the detriment to gameplay that comes out of too much instruction. So these images are from a study uh, at MIT and um, a woman named Laura Schultz has done this particular study. And Alison Gopnik at University of California in Berkeley has also done some really interesting tube toy experiments where they walk in to a preschool classroom with a toy and say, look at this amazing toy. And in one scenario, the teacher says, look at this toy. Look what it does. And she squeezes one thing and makes a noise and pulls on one thing and makes another noise, then puts it down in front of the child and leaves. In another scenario, if the teacher walks in and says, look at this amazing toy, what do you think it does? And just sets it down and walks away. In the first scenario, those children are 
most likely to only do the two things that the teacher modeled for them. In the second scenario, the child figures out usually 11 or 12 different things that that toy can do uh, because they are just exploring with it. Now, if you think about, if you, if you know any children who play video games, if you play video games yourself, you often, when you sit down to one of those big console games, there's not a lot of instruction. You often don't know where you are, and you have to kind of explore to figure out the situation you're in. Uh, the same goes with these kinds of digital games and learning. Kids kind of sit down, they're ready to play. I can tell you from years of user testing that kids are always going to skip instructions, even if you have them there. They are not interested. <laughs> they want to get right to the gameplay. So there's something that they already expect to just explore uh, when they sit down to a game. But also, those instructions can actually take away from the experience. Um, wrong answers also really, really matter. And I mentioned this in the, in the practice game scenarios. But if you, if you are watching a game or you're previewing a game to use in a classroom, and if it's not an assessment game, and every time, a child, every time you click on a wrong answer, it just says, nope, try again, this is not going to be a very helpful game. You really want to look for games that are responding to the decision the child made and giving them an indicator about why that's a wrong answer. Uh, this is a game on Curious George called Fair Shares. Uh, you're trying to give each dog an equal number of bones. And the man in the yellow hat will say things like, no, it doesn't look like the gray dog has enough bones now based on the decisions that you make. He really is responding to how the child is interacting with the game. And when we did tests with kids about their, their math knowledge here, the kids who had those wrong answer prompts did much better than the kids who were just told, nope, wrong answer. So games and social emotional skills. Um, is anyone familiar with this book, Jane McGonigal's Reality is Broken? This is a book about games and digital games in modern day life. And Jane McGonigal's, um, her, her theory here is that games actually are preparing kids for better critical thinking skills and life skills than most of what they are taught in formal classrooms. It's a very interesting book. If you don't have time to read it, she also has some really interesting TED Talks. Um, but I think she makes some points that are really great. One is that when a child sits down to play a game, they are walking into it with an expectation that they are going to fail several times before they figure it out. That's how games work. You have so many lives, you know you're going to blow through several of them before you figure out how to do this best. Um, the other thing about a really good digital game is that you achieve a level of what we call flow. And that is when you're in kind of a hard, fun situation. You're right up against the edge of your own abilities, and you know that achievement and mastery is always just, just beyond where you are. And that motivates you to keep playing. You know you're about to beat this level, and so you want to do it again and again. So what she is suggesting is that games really put kids into this hard, fun mentality, that they are failing, trying again. They're not nervous about failing, but they're working towards achievement and mastery. So we've been thinking about these principles a lot as we're developing games for really young kids. What, what can we do with collaboration with games? What can we do to help kids get that feeling of achievement and mastery as they're playing? And what is it about games that can build resilience in kids? This, this idea that it's OK to fail um, really is good for getting kids to keep trying things. And then creative thinking, like I mentioned with the no instructions. When kids have to figure it out on their own, they sometimes come up with really brilliant things. So mentorship is one thing that we have definitely been paying a lot of attention to in gameplay. Uh, and there are two examples that, that um, I've heard about from other, other research work out there. One is in an actual physical game capacity. There is an organization in the Middle East called Skatistan, which is taking kids um, in the West Bank and putting them out together to skateboard. And that's really all it is. It's an after-school program where kids are skateboarding together. But the folks who are doing this noticed something really interesting as they were watching the kids skate and began to study it. And that was that some of the kids who weren't very great at school and weren't very successful at school were really amazing skateboarders. And when they were out there with other kids who weren't great skateboarders, they suddenly took on a leadership quality that their teachers had never seen in the classroom. 
they became mentors to the kids who weren't as great at skateboarding. And when they went, went into the classroom later to do lessons, the, the skating instructors and the teachers began to watch this flip because the kids who had been mentored outside while skateboarding suddenly were in the position to mentor the kids who weren't as great at, at school-based skills. And the playing field had leveled a little bit. They weren't nervous to play with each other. They already had been in this kind of mentor leadership role together. Um, similarly, Stanford University and Northwestern University have a consortium called the Life Center, which is learning in informal uh, environments. And they did some studies where they were watching, very similarly, kids who didn't have great school skills playing video games with kids who hadn't played the video games before. And they watched those kids maneuver um, leadership because they were told, I need you to teach this kid how to play this game. And suddenly, this kid who usually was never like the star student in class was in charge of showing another kid how to play. And they took on great leadership and tutorial uh, roles. They began to mentor. They also, the teachers were watching them navigate informational texts in ways that they never see them do it in the classroom because it had such utility for the kid in the game itself. And so we're trying to think about how can we create two-player games or gaming scenarios that allow some kids to mentor and lead, or, uh, lead other kids. And so in some of the after-school programs where we're, we're um, testing our games, we're looking for just that, to do that kind of testing. Uh, another thing that we hear pretty regularly is um, from teachers who work with kids with special needs or with learning disabilities, that a lot of the games we have offer great opportunities to connect with some of the kids around particularly some social emotional skills. Uh, so Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood is a show from the Fred Rogers Company based on the principles of Fred Rogers. Um, and it's bringing that social emotional curriculum through an animated character to today's kids. Um, some of the games that we have on pbskids.org are about role playing. So this is an open ended game where Daniel and his friends are together for a tea party. And we've heard about teachers using this with kids who are having trouble taking turns, who are having trouble understanding when they need to relinquish the toy or when they need to be able to share with somebody else. Because it's a role playing scenario with characters that kids already know and are very comfortable with. If the children have watched the show at home, then they come in and look at this and they know Daniel is their friend and they're ready to play this game with Daniel and begin to practice some of these skills. One of my favorite experiences with Daniel Tiger is um, in an app called Gorific Feelings. And Daniel asks you to go into a photo booth, and then he shows you a face. And he says, I'm sad. Can you show me your sad face? And then the child takes a picture of their sad face. Um, we've had many special ed teachers write to us to say this is something that they're using regularly in their classrooms. Because oh, This is my son Ben, by the way. <laughs> he was beta testing this game before it was launched. Um, once the child takes that picture and the teacher validates this, like yes, this is the surprised face, the child's picture populates throughout the game. So anytime you come to other scenarios where you need a surprised emotion, it is the child's photo themselves of them surprised, reflecting back to them um, to help reinforce what these different emotions look like on other faces. Another thing that um, we've been thinking a lot about is accessibility in design, particularly with kids with learning disabilities. Um, and so David Rose at the CAST Center, which is a center for accessible media, uh, who works a lot with universal design of games, um, share these, these uh, brain scans and information with us. And it's a comparison, this is a little hard to read, it's a comparison of a nine-year-old good reader against the brain scan of a nine-year-old dyslexic reader. And then at the bottom, what we're looking at is the heart rate and uh, the skin temperature of a child with learning disabilities. And this is specifically, if this child is asked to read, what, what David Rose was explaining to us is that child goes into threat mode. They're in fight or flight. All of a sudden, their, temperature, their blood pressure goes up, the temperature, skin temperature goes up. They are really panicked. And his challenge to us is when a child who has learning disabilities is told you get to go play a game, 
they don't have this kind of response. And so what can we do with the technology, with a reading game um, that is allowing them to hear things and see words, but also allowing them to play a game in a comfortable environment, maybe with the characters they already know, to help introduce some concepts and let them practice things without having to go through this incredibly emotional response to being asked to, to interact with these skills to begin with. It's a really fascinating area for game development and something that I think can be really useful to teachers over time. Um, I know there's some work happening right now at Georgetown University. Um, a woman named Sandy Calvert is doing research around how kids learn from characters. And what she's beginning to see is that kids seem to be taking away more skills from characters they know than from characters that they don't know. And so we're thinking about for things like PBS Kids characters, who are in so many homes every day and who are kind of trusted friends, what are the opportunities we have for bringing that kind of educational content to children through those characters? So games, I believe, can do a lot of this kind of work and can really help kids get into new experiences, but it's really all about how we mediate it as adults, how teachers and parents can introduce this to kids. So um, it's a special day. It's a two Fred Rogers quote day. <laughs> um, um, Fred Rogers regularly said that play is talked about as if it were relief from serious learning. For, but for children, play is serious learning. And it really is the work of childhood. There is so much that kids can learn through play. And I know you all know this. But I think it's, it's really about taking this to this digital space as well. How do we give them? play environments that are truly educational environments, and how do we then pair them with hands-on experiences, with interaction experiences that help enhance the learning overall. So resources, I promised I would share with you um, some of the, the places where we have all this. Once again, New Hampshire Public Television has um, learning media on their site, and this includes all of the pbskids.org games and videos. Uh, for use in your classroom. They're searchable. It's all free. Um, and PBS Learning Media is, is national, um, but that's included in this New Hampshire version. Uh, the, the research that I shared with you is at pbskids.org slash lab. That's where you'll find all of the specific math games that we are working on, as well as the new literacy research that we're doing with games. So you can see the research there, as well as the games and the videos themselves um, that have gone through the most rigorous testing. Uh, if you're looking for PBS Kids apps, they're all listed at pbskids.org slash apps. Um, and we are um, on both Android and iOS, so uh, most of our things are accessible there. The PBS Kids video app is probably um, one of the largest resources we have, and that is streaming video content for all PBS Kids shows. Uh, it is free. It's on Android and on iOS, and, um, is, and also on desktops. And so it's a great way to access PBS Kids content. So with that, thank you so much for being here. Um, 9.35, not too bad. <laughs> uh, I have a few minutes. If people have questions, feel free to um, come on up, or we can take some from the audience. But thank you so much again for having me.